It's wonderful to thank you. To thank, first of all, uh, um, Gabrielle and Joanne for their scientific vision, because all this program was really assembled by them. And we've seen incredible talks, three days of really beautiful talks and amazing diversity from the talks of Freddie written by hand, with this idea of going totally orthogonally to whatever other people are doing, to talks which are deep technical mathematics to beautiful empirical and uh, algorithmic results. I think this is really the DNA of this community and uh, I'd like to come uh, back to that. It's strange to be crossing uh, 60 years and be here. I mean, you've heard uh, Rougenas saying, uh, after three years, I just wanted to get out of there. My goal was uh, essentially go to, to the US. And uh, this has been much more than, than just research. Uh, it's a style of life. It's meeting many friends who are here. Uh, and it's meaning also, a sense of beauty sometimes when we do research, excitations. I think it's an incredible, uh, incredible life that we're having. Maybe uh, the one who took the RORB can realize that half of France is on strike because people don't want to work two years more. And Roger Nabaiji is 90 and still is hoping to continue to work. And I think most of us hope that this journey will be as long as possible. And that's a reflection of how lucky we are to do that work of research, pursuit of knowledge, teaching with a wonderful student. So that's a luck I didn't imagine one second uh, uh, having. Now, there is also a kind of sense of family that we all have. Uh, of course, uh, our advisors, siblings, which are all the ones with whom we've been uh, working, uh, students. I, I, I have a position which is a bit different because uh, most of you are single child children. You had one advisor. I'm in this particular situation where uh, I had two parents. Uh, two parents, but uh, who were totally separated. Uh, I think they never met, in fact. I mean, one you just saw, Regina Baiji, who is an incredible uh, uh, engineer, had a vision about what computer vision, what robotics should be, but she had a life which is a real novel. At age 11, uh, she went from, she escaped uh, Gestapo, went from Slovakia, to United States escaping in 1967, 68, uh, the tanks, Soviet tanks arriving in the US, being one of the first women who ever got a PhD in, uh, at Stanford, and then creating with few pioneers around the whole field. So she is someone who is doing, at the same time she had this love for mathematics, but from far away. And then I had an adopted father that you've heard about, Yves Meyer, who is this incredible pure mathematician, who was also in love with application, but this was a totally platonic love. He was <laughs> never even touched it. He was just loving the idea of the possibility of uh, application. And my DNA is a kind of crossing uh, of, uh, of these two uh, approaches. Uh, I think that's also the DNA of this community. And this is why it's, for me, it's an amazing community, this mix of engineering, mathematics, physics. And I think that's what kept it so juvenile. Why 40 years ago, we are still so many in this conference with uh, uh, young people around. And I think that it was very interesting, the, the talk of Dave about this tension between uh, theory and, uh, and empirical work is very interesting, but I think I, I have a slightly different uh, view about it. Yes, we are in the temple of mathematics, of pure mathematics, and uh, yes, to be able to freely uh, work on uh, pure ideas is something that can be incredibly creative. But sometimes you end up in a hole 
end up specializing and things get narrower, narrower and narrower. And experiment is, is what checks up all this. No respect whatever for beautiful theory. If it doesn't match the table, it just doesn't work. And I think that this is extremely important. And on the other hand, experiment without theory, without mathematics has essentially little meaning. So for me, beauty is there. Beauty is the meeting of these incredible ideas. And we've seen that during these three days and the experimental, the, in some sense, what's happening uh, uh, in the world. And the last thing a bit general before going in something a bit more concrete is that I found there is something a bit strange in the way uh, uh, the idea develops. Uh, um, Jan, you spoke about all these things that had to be wiped out and uh, have to be rethinking uh, about it, which is indeed important to try to say, let's get out. That's our first reflex, let's get out, let's go. But what we all experience a bit is we come back to these ideas. And my impression is that there is no linear time in research. It's more like a spiral. We get out and we come back and we revisit, but from a slightly different point of view. And the amazing thing is that this spiral is moving and we have no idea where it's going, but we come back to similar idea from totally different point of view. And for me, there is three ideas that uh, I've been turning around, thinking I would free myself coming back. Three ideas which really have no origin in time. Uh, the first one, of course, is hierarchy. Hierarchy, which has been translated into scale separation, which became uh, wavelets. And of course, I spent part of my life on that. The second one is old as it can be, is this idea of simplicity, Occam razor that Remy spoke about, that became spar uh, sparsity, regularity. And the third one was the most strange to me at the beginning, which is the idea of serendipity, which is uh, compressed sensing, randomness, random projections. And what I like very much about deep networks is that it's allowing to revisit all these ideas from a totally different point of view and forces us to rethink all that. And that's a little bit what I'd like to speak about during uh, these uh, 15 or 20 more minutes. So the beginning is, of course, the architecture of a convolutional neural network, which is still this beautiful mystery, whether it's for supervised or unsupervised uh, learning, what is the underlying ma mathematics. And we know that there is structure. There is a lot of prior which is hidden within this architecture. And at the same time, I hoped at the time that learning uh, was not necessary. I lost my bet, I lost the three-star restaurants, and I want to come back to that because, of course, I want to get something out of this three-star restaurant. But there is uh, <laughs> many ideas that is coming out of it. Okay, what's the role of the architecture, nonlinearity, channels, and so on? What about the weights? This is incredibly complicated because each time you relearn, you have new set of weights. How can we build models of these weights? And of course, the Graal, which is understand the output. What is the class of functions which correspond to the output? What are the functional spaces? What can we learn? What we can't learn? How to deal with this famous curse of dimensionality? So I said I wanted to go and look back, and maybe uh, it's in the sense of what Guillermo uh, spoke about. It's always very interesting to go back to read uh, original fundamental work. And that's what I spent part of my time during COVID uh, doing. Uh, so the problem under, uh, under uh, unsupervised learning is about estimating probability distribution. But in physics, it means understanding the physics, because it means understanding the energy. If you get the gradient of the energy, you have access to the force, you have access to the interactions. And can we estimate that, of course, without suffering from the curse of dimensionality? And obviously, this is at the center of uh, statistical physics. And 
people have been trying to see what was the origin of wavelets and so on. Nobody ever found, and each time you look in a different field, you find the origin of it. So one of the origin is the renormalization group and this incredible work of Gadanov and especially Wilson who got the Nobel Prize in the 90s. So that's another way to view the idea of hierarchy, pyramid and so on. And the key idea of Wilson is that when you have a very high dimensional system as you can encounter in physics, if you want to look at the probability distribution of this field which is the cosmic web, what you should do is average subsample, average subsample, coarsen up progressively and look at the evolution of the probability distribution at each of the scale. And the key idea is that this probability distribution has a very regular evolution across scale if you normalize the coefficient. And what that means is that one way to describe this probability distribution, and this is explicit in the calculation of Wilson, is that you should first begin at very coarse scale where you have a very low dimensional uh, system, and then you progressively move across scale by looking at the conditional probability distribution at fine scale given the coarse scale, and you have a decomposition of your probability distribution as a kind of mark of uh, uh, evolution. The key idea is that this conditional probability distribution, and we see it all over AI, is much simpler if you understand how to build the conditioning. Now, this was done in uh, statistical physics of a relatively simple model, like ferromagnetic models or easing models, where basically in the energy you only have a quadratic term and what is called a scalar term which is non-convex which force the value of the image to be either in the neighborhood of one or minus one which is corresponding to spins so depending upon the liter the temperature you can have a totally disordered system or very long range correlations now the beauty of the work of Wilson what he showed is that everything can be simply understood if you look at these conditional probabilities. The only problem is that that never went so far, never has been applied to turbulence, interesting thing, because there was no model. And that's where machine learning came in, as we'll see. Now, before doing that, uh, one of the ideas of Wilson was in fact that you should decompose with wavelets and in the 1970s he came out with these wavelets. The idea is that if you want to look a high resolution image compared to a low resolution image what you should do is extract the complementary information of the high resolution image that sorry, sorry so that you can build a high resolution image from the low resolution image and what is this complementary information these are the high frequencies that you extract by doing convolution with wavelets. Now what we now have are techniques to do that in orthogonal basis and that's what the wavelet will do. You get the low frequency and the orthogonal wavelet coefficients. The low frequency you sub decompose and so on. Now the key idea is that now this conditional probability of high resolution given low resolution and that's in the calculation of Wilson. You can view it as the probability of the wavelet coefficient given the low frequency. And the low frequency, you can subdecompose it into wavelets. So all this can translate into interaction across scale. So the key idea is that you can understand these very complex probability distribution if you can understand the interaction conditional probabilities across scales. So that's the decomposition. And uh, one of the surprise, but again, that appears indirectly in the calculation of Wilson, is that these conditional probabilities, instead of being global, which leads to curse of dimensionality, they are local. If you want to understand the conditional probability of the eye given the low frequency, you don't need to look at a very large neighborhood, and that was what Eero Simoncelli was referencing. You can get very low call conditioning so that you have no more uh, curse of dimensionality. More than that, this is totally non-stationary. But the non-stationarity is only in the low frequency. 
The conditional probability can be stationary. This is why you can implement that with a convolutional network and local. Now, before going to convolutional network, we, this is a harmonic analysis conference, so let's look once at the Fourier transform. This is an image, this is the Fourier transform. So a wavelet transform, if you show it as a neural net, it computes the low frequency and all the high frequency bands that you can see here obtained with wavelet convolution. Next layer, next layer. Now, when you look at this image of a boat, you can see that they are very dependent across scale. The edges are essentially the same because they correspond to the geometry, the contour of the boat. So this is very dependent upon the other scale. However, and what is the difficulty and why this problem of scale dependence really hasn't been solved until the coming out of these neural nets, is that this dependence is totally nonlinear. Why is it nonlinear? Because if you look at the correlation of the wavelet coefficient at one scale with wavelet coefficient at another scale, whatever position, this is always going to be zero because of the phase fluctuation. Because these coefficients live in different frequency bands, so their correlation are zero. So if you want to have a correlation which is non-zero, you need to put a nonlinearity which is going to kill the phase. And the nonlinearity can be a rectifier, or if you want to make it simpler from a math point of view, you can take the modulus and look at these correlation matrices. These correlation matrices are non-zero anymore, so you can capture these famous conditional probabilities across scale. However, these matrices are huge, because you have to compute them for any scale, any position. But if you do a new transform, a new wavelet transform, you basically nearly diagonalize these covariance matrix. What does that mean? That means the only thing that you need to do is to get the correlation across the channels and you are going to get a correlation which is stationary. Therefore, this is a 1-1 one -one convolutional uh, kernel. So the only thing that you need is to compute these covariance along the channels if you use a ROLU or a modulus and, let's say, a skip connection. Okay, so that's the kind of work that was carried uh, with many of you, in fact, Erwan, who is here, uh, Rudy Morel, uh, and so on. And the idea was, can we do what we couldn't do, with Wilson couldn't do, meaning can we now deal with very complex fields such as these turbulent fluids or uh, this kind of uh, cosmic web? And the answer is yes, with only one image, 500 coefficients. Not only you get here good looking images, but these are maximum entropy models, so it guarantees maximum uh, variability, and it reproduces third order or fourth order moments, so you really have models. But that works for that kind of unstructured problem. What about image classification? And that's where I'm coming to the bet. Okay, so if you want to do classification, the first idea, and that was initiated by uh, Johan, is to say, okay, let's do that kind of cascade of transformations. And what we can also do, because we know that dealing with the correlation across scale uh, can be useful, is to try to understand the properties that we should implement across the channels. And we can think about that, for example, in audio, we can think about that in different kinds of signals. And there was some very beautiful work that was done by uh, Joachim and then Vince, uh, uh, Vincent uh, Le Stenlen. And in the case of audio, it works pretty well. Now, there was this bet to go, we'll come back to it. So the bet is scattering transform is there. 20% on CIFAR 10 and ResNet is 8%. 50% uh, uh, on ImageNet and ResNet is doing four times better. So you have a huge gap. And that's where I think tables are interesting. I think tables are interesting because they are asking deep questions. When you have such a gap, that means you are really missing something huge, okay? It's not just a detail. And so the question is, what is it? And so, 
as uh, Edward said, I took a guy who is brilliant, very good and courageous, and say, please save the bet, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> that was his mission. And uh, the conclusion is basically, too bad for you, you have to pay. Okay, so I had to pay, but at least I had a great question. So, okay, what are we going to put in this hall? And there's two very brilliant students, uh, Florentin Gut and John Zarka, who came, say, okay, so let's learn. Okay, let's learn. And what they proposed is to just learn the one-one convolutional network here. So keep in space the wavelets. So we don't learn the spatial filter. Is it enough to just learn the 1-1 one -one convolutional uh, filter? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So, OK, you are very happy. You fill up the table. You had the right percentage. The problem is that you lost the math, OK? Because now you've learned. But what is it that you've been learning? And as I said before, when you are in a state of mind coming from harmonic analysis, sparsity, wavelets, and so on, what you try to find are groups, convolution along groups, and try to interpret these uh, linear filters as convolution along groups. So we looked into the weights, and when you want to find something, you always find it. So of course we found Fourier transform along the thing. The only problem is we only found it here. And then it's a mess. Beside the first layer, it just looked like the mess. So, that was the fault of the network, of course. But uh, OK, after a while, you have to try to find uh, some kind of new ideas. And model for L, when you look at the literature, there are some very beautiful things that have been happening in the last uh, three, four years, five years. Let me come back to one hidden layer network. One hidden layer network, so fully connected, you have your input, your uh, hidden layer here that you can think of a feature vector and you have these linear weights that is going to define the output okay from this inner product with the weight that corresponds to the line of the operator L. Now there is one observation is that when the width increase and that was uh, uh, very much mentioned by Francis uh, Bach you see that the kernel, in other words, the inner product of the feature vector in x and x prime, has a tendency to converge when the width goes to infinity. And the reason is that what you're looking is at the product of these uh, inner, inner products. And if the weights looks a bit random and have some decorrelations and are identically distributed, this is going to converge to an expected value. And that was the model of a Hachimi and Resht. So why random? Why random? Because first of all, you begin with a random initialization. So, and you make a stochastic run, uh, um, a gradient descent. And you can show that when the width is increasing, because all these coefficients are uh, can be uh, inverted, it has a tendency to converge to identically distributed weights, which can become nearly independent. Now, the consequence of that is something that is important and that uh, Florentin Gut realized, is that if you look at these hidden layers, which is totally random, which is going to change from one training to the other training, you know that it's going to converge to a kernel, which is a deterministic kernel. So this kernel, you can write it as an inner product of a deterministic feature vector. What that means is that all these random layers can be viewed as a rotation of a deterministic feature vector. Now that's important to understand deep network. Why? One maybe of the diff most difficult question in deep network is to understand the dependency upon these weights. Okay, these weights are random in different layers, but how does they depend one upon the other? One answer is that basically they are all rotation of a fixed feature vectors at each depth, and it is these rotations that specify the dependency from one layer to the other. 
To understand that, there is this very nice theorem proved by Florentin, which basically say, OK, at the first layer, obviously, this is deterministic. It's the data, so uh, phi of x is the identity. If you suppose the property to be true, in other words, and j minus 1 is going to be some rotation of a fixed deterministic uh, feature vector, if the weights are themselves a rotation of i, the uh, feature vector following a law, then you can show that when the widths converge, the next layer is itself going to be a rotation of a fixed feature vector. In other words, the kernels are going to converge. Now, is that true? Then you can come back to the network and verify it. Now, if you go, and that's the work of Florentin, uh, Gaspar Rochette, and Brice Ménard. If you go on neural nets such as on CIFAR, and you look at all layers, you can see that indeed modulo rotation, all the layers, activation layers, they converge to a fixed layer up to a random rotation. Now, the question then is to understand what is this fixed layer, this uh, deterministic layer in that framework. Another way to say it is what the probability distribution of the random feature. Now, another observation, at least in CIFAR, is that initially the weights are Gaussian. When the iteration goes on, it's as if it's only the covariance of these Gaussians which change. They change a lot. But if you whiten the weight, you almost go back to the initialization. That has an important implication, is that the weights are almost Gaussian conditionally to the previous one. So how do you verify that? You look, you whiten the weight, and you look at the distribution of their eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. It should converge to a well-known distribution, which is called the March and Copas Tour distribution. For j equal 2, it's very nice. As it goes on, it remains almost true up to some outliers, about 10% here, which can have an important role. I'll come back to it. But then you have this model. So let me, here's the model. The mathematical model now is the following. Each layer, the weights are Gaussian random variable, each line of the matrix is independent, but they are conditionally Gaussian. Why? Because the covariance matrix is a rotated covariance. You have the fixed covariance, and the rotation is due to the previous layer. The previous layer have been rotated, so they rotate the next layer. So the only thing which is random here is the fact, of course, that it's a Gaussian random variable, and sorry, the covariance has a dependency upon the previous layers through these rotations. The consequence of that, and I suppose that that has some relation with the first slide probably of, uh, of uh, Shihab, who opened the conference, it's converging to a rainbow. So why a rainbow? Because at each layer, these random weights, they converge when the width increase to a fixed feature vector. And how is it the fixed feature vector computed? You have a covariance matrix, or the square root of the covariance matrix, which in fact does a dimension reduction. And then you have the random feature, which have been whitened. And the random feature, they define what is called a dot product kernel. The, inner pr the, cr the kernel is only which depends upon the entry z and z prime, only depends upon the inner product. So you have covariance, a fixed uh, feature vector of a dot product, a covariance, up it goes, and each time what changes from one learning to the other is just the covariance matrix. So it's just the color of the rainbow that changes when you do, within such a model, one training or the other training. And the function space here, which is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, now can be entirely specified mathematically and is parametrized by the covariance. OK, so does it work? Back to the numerics. If it works, that means that once you've learned 
one network, you can estimate the covariance, you can create zillions of networks without learning, just by resampling your Gaussian matrices, you are going to get totally different weights, and it should give you the same performance. So, you try, that's the original performance, that's the gap, no more learning, you just resample, and here you lose a bit, about 3%. Now, when you see a result like that, and you are used to uh, read papers in uh, image processing or machine learning, you immediately say, hey, why do you show CIFAR 10 and not ImageNet? So the answer could be, of course, oh, I didn't try and so on. But nobody would trust me if I was saying I didn't try. It gets more problematic. It gets more problematic because we can see here in the layer, you see you have these outliers. And these outliers in CIFAR are not so bad, it works pretty well. These outliers begin to look more difficult in ImageNet. But now you can do math and think, okay, what's the mathematical nature of these outliers? These seems like what one would think of some kind of fixed features or whatever. Interesting questions to think about. So, great, that's not the end of the story. That's how I would uh, end up this thing. However, for me, there is something a bit new because I was always thinking, again, in deterministic term and compressed sensing or uh, random projection, whatever, came into the, pro the, the picture. And so we have a new set of math problems. So I'd like just to finish by thanking all of you, especially in some sense the more narrow family, namely Rujena, Yves, and all the students who gave me so much energy and so much pleasure to uh, do research, and all of you siblings who came. Thank you very much for coming to these three days. Thanks very much. I mean, conference is over. We just wanted to thank everyone for coming. I think, I mean, for us it has been super fun, and you know, it has been a pleasure to, to see your family. You know, all the three generations we have seen, and maybe more. Uh, so yeah, uh, happy birthday! When do we meet again? Yeah, happy birthday! Again. Someone has to decide. He will be the next one. I hope in Israel, maybe. So send us an email if you want, if you want to organize a birthday. Send us an email. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these are professional now. <laughs> you can almost spend your life doing that. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.